Amen. Open up our Bibles, please, to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, please. We're going to try to finish up this chapter this morning, Lord willing. John chapter 11. We'll go ahead and pray before we get right into our Sunday school lesson here. So we need the Lord's help to understand these things. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for this chance for us elders here to gather together to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Holy Ghost so that your spirit will be able to illuminate us and teach us with regards to what we're going to cover here at the end of uh, John chapter 11. This is an important topic and one that if uh, people recognize it, they might stop following certain groups with counsels. And Father, give you thanks and praise uh, for all things, especially for that salvation that you brought through your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And this morning we're going to continue our studies here in the Gospel of John. And we just finished up seeing the miracle that the Lord performed in John chapter 11 when he rose Lazarus from the dead. And by that miracle he proved clearly through evidence, through logic, through theology, through everything possible that he is the resurrection and the life. And now we're going to see some of the responses to that from those that witnessed the event. You might say, well, we know, we know what Martha and Mary and the disciples thought. Amen. But they're already believers. I'm curious to know what those who didn't believe were thinking. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And so we're in John 11 and verse 45, the Bible says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. And glory to God. Yeah. There were some Jews, some of the religious uh, leaders there that were... Help trying to help Mary with her mourning and all this, and they witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus. They saw this great miracle. They saw the words that came with that miracle, and for once, they actually believed on Jesus Christ. Yeah. And the reality is, I imagine if you were there historically to see these things, it'd be very hard to reject the miracles, especially if they're done right in front of you. Especially one as great as raising someone from the dead. Clearly, only the living God could do something so great. Clearly only the Messiah can do something that great. Yeah? This is passing Moses. This is greater. But as always, the reality is there was division among the Jews who visited Mary and Martha. And for that reason, verse 46 is in the Bible. So let's go ahead and read that. But, there's a sad but. There's a lot of buts in the Bible. Yeah, there's a sad one. Yeah. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Now, this is interesting. Okay. And we see that the chief priests, the Pharisees, and even those Jews that did not believe on him, none of them could actually reject or deny the miracles that they saw. Okay. But we're seeing here that miracles don't really produce faith either. See? It was the word of God tied with the miracle that demonstrated that truth. That led these people to believing on Jesus Christ, which means they trusted in his words. And there were others there who saw Jesus, heard Jesus talk, saw the miracles, and yet they did not believe. And instead of that, it seems like miracles produce counsels. And those counsels are against guys. That's what we end up seeing here. Very interesting. Okay. And so the question this morning is, what does the Lord actually think about counsels? Okay. That's what we're going to look at here. Counsels, the Biblical perspective. There's only one. So there's, there's, there's no opinion here. This is what God thinks. And if you pick this up, you might be a little wary of counsel. Yeah. And you see, in this case, they're getting ready to deal with to deal with Jesus in some way because they, they know they got to do something. This man keeps doing miracles. He keeps proving to a lot of people who he is, and we can't deal with that. Yeah. So go to Matthew 10. Let's go ahead and run some verses here. Matthew chapter 10, please. I'm going to do a little word study on the word consul. Matthew 10 and verse 16, the Bible says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Okay. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the consuls. And they will scourge you in their synagogues. Now notice that, it's interesting. 
So when the Lord mentions counsel to his disciples, he tells them that you might be delivered up to these and they're going to scorch you there. They're not going to agree with you. They're going to be in disagreement and react and manifest that by their actions. See? You might say, well, that, that's good and dandy, Lord. You're telling your disciples this, but what about you? Well, a servant isn't greater than his master. See? Go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Hey, good morning, brother. Matthew 26. And verse 59, we're going to see what a consul did against Jesus Christ. Matthew 26 and verse 59, the Bible says, Now the chief priests and elders and all the consul sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. That don't sound good, do it? See? It sounds like when people gather together and form a council, it's against the will of God. It's against the Son of God. See? And that's why they're prepping false witness and trying to find a way to kill him. And we'll, we'll figure out if that's actually manifested in John 11 as well as we continue in that context. Yeah. So the Lord dealt with it first. But he tried to warn his disciples to get them prepped and ready because he knew that after he rose from the dead and went to be at the right hand of the majesty on high, he would be sending out his apostles and disciples out throughout the world, and they too would have to deal with consuls to which they would be delivered up. So let's see that prophecy manifested in the history of the, of the Word of God. Okay. Go to Acts 5. The Acts of the Apostles, who were the ones the Lord was talking to in Matthew 10. <clears throat> Acts 5 and verse 27, the Bible says. And when they had brought them, these were some Jews bringing the apostles. Okay? So the they is the Jews, the them is the apostles. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, did not we straightway command you that ye should not teach in this name? Talking about the name of Jesus. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Very interesting. Verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the consul, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So here you see two things going on with these disciples of Jesus Christ. When they go to a council, the council says, don't preach in the name of Jesus. Don't preach his doctrine. Be contrary to that. And don't go around saying that this man's blood is upon us, even though that's exactly what was the truth. They put him to death. You see, they did the action, but they don't want that preached. Because that was part of our previous preaching, if you look at Acts 2. So, so much so that when the disciples were delivered out of that council, they realized that they were persecuted. They were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. And this is the reality of disciples today as well. When we go and deal with the councils of today, they're going to speak contrary to the doctrinal truths in the word of God, and you're going to be persecuted, Christian. Yeah. You're going to get scourged, whether spiritually or physically, by that council. Go to Acts 6. Acts 6. We'll look at verse 8 to get some context about this chapter. <clears throat> the Bible says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So we're talking about Stephen, verse 12. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man seeth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Notice that again, false witnesses, just like with Jesus. See that? And the false testimony there is that he was speaking blasphemy. The truth was he was speaking the truth. And he was giving it in love. Because he didn't want his people to die in their sins. See if you want to see the fruit of that council, read Acts 7. You'll find out that they stoned a child of God. So councils ain't looking too good in the Bible. See that? Yeah. Now, are there councils today? How about the World Council of Churches? How about that one? World Council of Churches is not in accordance with the Word of God. That's why it's a world council. See that? 
If you have friendship with the world, it's enmity with God, the Bible says. And so we see that sometimes when men gather together, but they do so to work against the truth of God, you have a counsel there. Okay? But we're gathered together this morning. So is it really just gathering together or is there more to understand here? Because you can kind of say that we're a council. But the Bible gives what we're doing this morning a different name. Okay, go to Acts 15. Acts 15. You might say this is obvious, man, but this is why it became obvious. It was established first in the Bible. And now we have 2,000 years of history to back it up. See? But there is a beginning to these things. Acts 15, we'll go to verse 4, the Bible says, And when they were come to Jerusalem, and the context here is they're here to contend a certain doctrine. You had some Pharisees saying that they that uh, certain people needed to be circumcised in order to be saved, and that was getting discussed there. Okay. So verse 4, And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. And here we have a gathering of people and it's called a church. See that? And the church is discussing what God had done with them. Notice the difference. Consuls have false witness against God, speak against God, work against the Lord and his people and his word. But a church, if it's a real one, is an assembly of people that come together to discuss what God has had and will continue to do with them. Same chapter, verse 25. Verse 25. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord. And there's a difference. It's not just an assembly. You're assembling with one accord to do what? To send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a difference. If you have an assembly of people that are in one accord to hazard their lives for the name of Jesus Christ, to try to live for God is how we preach. That is called a church. That is a congregation. Okay. Bible talks a lot about that. We won't look at those verses, but there is a congregation of the Lord. There is no council of the Lord. Look it up. You won't find it. So. Now you might say, why is this important, man? Okay. Well, today you're going to hear a lot about councils. You won't hear much about people talking about congregations. Okay. Or you hear people talking about churches, but not a Bible believing. Okay. And so if you can recognize that difference, you at least get a red flag in your head that spiritually comes from the Holy Ghost that says, I better see what this council is about. This probably ain't good. Okay. That general eternal truth will transcend and affect reality today. And that's why they call these certain groups consuls. Why don't they call them congregations or churches? Huh? So. And the key difference between the assembly of these men is basically whether or not God is dealing with the business there, God is involved, his name is being lifted up, or his name is not being lifted up. Those are the big differences. Go to John 11 now. John 11. I know pastor's waiting, but I'm going to let the Bible get us to that example. Okay. John 11. It's obviously my favorite example to bring up. John 11 and verse 48, the Bible says, If we let him thus alone, remember this is the council, this is what they're discussing here. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Oh no. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. See that? And we see here that those that work against Jesus Christ aren't working against him because they doubt his words or they doubt his miracles. It's because they want to keep their position as religious leaders. They don't want to lose their post. That's what this is about. If he comes in, he's the son of God. I have to bow down. I don't want to lose to him. But I don't want to lose my post with the Romans either. See that? Yeah. Councils of religion don't care about your soul. They only care about keeping control of it. Okay. The fear of man bringeth a snare, the Bible says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the way you can be made free and set free by Jesus Christ. So you won't be a servant of sin anymore. Yeah. Religion is not an interested okay, in you knowing God personally. Never was, never will be. Okay. Not only that, 
Like it says here, they're worried about losing their nation to the Romans, and that's kind of funny because it still happened anyway. We'll get to that. Okay. Now, they were speaking in that, in that historical context here based on what the book of Daniel had told them. Okay. It kind of shows that they understood some of these prophecies. Okay. And right now, they're under the Romans. The Roman government is ruling them. And yet, they still have a post. They don't want that completely wiped out is what they're saying. Okay. And so then, their next question is, what does the Bible say about Rome? Because Rome right now is in control and they're worried about losing their position with Rome when dealing with this man. Yeah. So let's look at that and then we'll try to connect everything together. Go to Acts 16. Acts chapter 16. Now, brethren are looking at me because they know where I'm going here. But that's where the Bible's going. Not my fault. Acts 16. I wish I could say that I made this up, but... These are all eternal precepts in the Bible. Have you looked? All right. Acts 16 and verse 16. We'll start there for some context. So you can see what's going on here. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. Okay, this is Paul and Luke. That's why it says we, for those who read the Bible. Okay. A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. I guess this isn't a good lady, right? She's possessed. Which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Notice she preached truth. Yes, she's an enemy of God. We'll get to that. Yeah. Verse 18. And thus did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said of the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So now this lady, she doesn't have that spirit anymore. She's not suicide. She's not able to make money to those who own her. So what's the result? Verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Okay. So we see here that they're saying we're Romans. So we're against the truth of the gospel. We're against the truth that these people are preaching. We don't agree with their customs and they ruin our money making. So get them out of here. So they run to the government to solve their problems. That's their God. Okay. Let me see them right there. So if you're up with the Romans, I guess you're not in agreement with God's people. That's what you're seeing here. Acts 18. Acts 18 and verse 1. So we see clearly they spoke against Jews that were Christians. Right there. Okay. Acts 18 and verse 1, Bible says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately uh, come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So here, not only do we see certain Christians, which are Aquila and Priscilla, and they're leaving Rome because the government commanded for Jews to come out. You see a persecution against Christians. Not only that, but also Jews in general. Now apply that to history. See a lot of Jews and actual true Christians, Bible-leading Christians getting persecuted by a bunch of Romans. Think about the Crusades. Was that really a Christian war? Not if you know your Bible. Okay? Bible believers were getting persecuted with those Jews during that period by both sides. Okay? Muslim or Catholic alike. Oh, okay, I said it. I just said it now. But I'm going to get there anyway. Okay? So Roman Catholicism was started with a bunch of consuls. Okay? I'll give you... I'll give you three examples, okay? Two were done in Nicaea, okay? In 325, they decided, okay, that Passover wouldn't be in accordance with the Passover of the Jews. They were going to go with Easter instead. Okay. They also decided that the Bishop of Rome was going to be the Pope. Okay. That he was going to have authority. That's when all that started, in a council. Okay. And that's against the Word of God. That's against Jesus Christ. That's not in the name of Jesus. 
And it was that same group that later continued to persecute true Bible believers throughout all of history. Or in 787, another consul in Nicaea. Okay? That's when they decided that the veneration of icons and images was okay. So now they're instituting idol worship. That's fine. It's just an aid to worship. That's okay. Totally contrary to the Word of God, contrary to the Ten Commandments, contrary to everything you read in the Old Testament. <clears throat> but yeah, it's, that's all right, because we're in a council. We assemble together to come up with our own ideas against God. That's what councils are. It's not a congregation. See, A congregation comes together in a local church to discuss what God has for us. That's what we saw in Acts 15. My, my opinion doesn't mean anything. See? What does God think? And then you get to the Council of Trent in 1545. That's where they decided that you were accursed and you were anathema if you believe that salvation was by justification through faith. Nothing more, nothing less. So, you're cursed, brother. Thank God that a cursed causeless shall not stand, the Bible says. Isn't that a blessing? I love how God's word took care of that. Thousands of years before it even happened. Okay. Book of Proverbs. Now, you might say, well, man, is everything bad from Rome? Well, no. I mean, the Book of Romans is pretty good. But you know what's funny about that? Most Roman Catholics have never read the Book of Romans. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm, one, I'm an example. I never read the Book of Romans until after I got saved. Isn't that interesting? And I know I've been trying man, <laughs> since I got saved to encourage Roman Catholics to read the Book of Romans. But no, they're quick to run to Matthew 25. That's all they want to run to. Okay, I just had an experience with that at work. <laughs> it's funny to me. You're a Roman Catholic. Why don't you read the Book of Romans? It's written to you. No, nah, I'm all right. Okay. I'd rather read James, and I'd rather read Matthew 25. Because okay. that says something I agree with. I don't care about the context. I don't care that that happens at the second coming. I'm going to take that and apply it the way I want to. And you're speaking against God. Okay. No wonder why you agree with that console instead of the congregation of the Lord. John 11, let's go back there. John 11, we're going to read verses 49 through 53 now. And we're going to see what happened, because they came together as a council, and they're working against Jesus Christ in some way, right? So let's see what happens in the midst of all this. I love how the Lord does this. This happens all the time. Yeah. Verse 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Yeah. Now that's weird. So you got the high priest there and he's speaking against their idea. We can't, we can't let him. He's saying, no, no, it's expedient for one to die. Almost like he's trying to prompt them. This is why he's using these things. He's trying to prompt them and lead them to the, to the conclusion he wants, which is we need to make him that one guy. Now, what's weird about that is verse 51. Okay? And this spake he not of himself, obviously. Or would he want to die for the people? He's self-centered. Okay? But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. See how the Bible tells you? He's talking about Jesus. He's, but his reasoning, see, his motivation for it isn't good. And yet he's still prophesying, and it fulfills the word of God. Verse 52. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together and one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then, from that day forth, notice that. So this is the result of what he said. They took counsel together for to put him to death. And that connects with Matthew 26 that we just read. See? They were trying to slay him in John 5. Now they're really going to put it into practice. They're going to do whatever they need to do. See that? The end justifies the means. There are a bunch of pragmatists at this point, just like the devil. Yeah. And in a council, they take counsel to put to death the Lord of glory. And that's what you see in councils today. Okay. They're not congregations who come to get counsel from the Lord. It's totally different. Okay. And so I have here written, if it's not obvious enough, it looks like councils want to kill Jesus. But the Lord already knew that. In fact, he wrote about it. Go to Psalm 2. Psalm chapter 2. 
You think this is a mystery to God Almighty? We should know better. God. And yet there are Christians today who think these things are a mystery to God, but they haven't read. Psalm 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers, that's the chief priests and the Pharisees and those Jews right there, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Jesus Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let's, let's get rid of them. There's the kill them there. See that? And now they find themselves quoting prophecy without knowing it. I'm going to show you which ones they quote or discuss a little. Yeah. And they fulfill prophecy by working against God. Isn't that interesting how that works? The Lord's got it all locked down. It doesn't matter which way you go. Whether you're saved or living for God or you're lost and working against God, either way you're fulfilling the word of God and the Lord's getting glory out of it. Praise the Lord. Okay. Go to Proverbs 19. What's the precept we can get from this that we can apply throughout all of time? Okay. This is the simple precept. Proverbs 19, verse 21, the Bible says, There are many devices in a man's heart, and we're seeing some. In that context there, we saw men gather together to counsel, to work against Jesus Christ, to work against the anointing of God, and to plot with the device of death against him. Okay, I'm pretty sure at that moment they might have discussed, oh, we're going we're gonna to throw a false trial at three in the morning. Okay. All these ideas are starting to manifest there. Okay. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't matter what people try to do. It doesn't matter. The greatest creature that God ever created, the devil himself, can't stop the word of God because the counsel of the Lord shall stand. So if you're wise as a person, you would get on the Lord's side, see? And you would receive the counsel of the Lord at a congregation instead of running to a world council that works against the Lord and against his anointing. That would be wise. Have you opened up the word of God? That is the counsel of the Lord. When the Lord says in a multitude of counselors there is safety, there's a reason why he wrote the Bible using 40 different authors over the span of over 1,500 years. So he could fulfill that for you. If you were by yourself and just had a Bible, you could still live that verse out. Praise the Lord. And the Jews here, they're fulfilling Proverbs 19, verse 21, and that continues today with all those who work against the truth of the Lord. It's a sad thing. Why don't they recognize the last part of that verse? Why don't they see that and say, we shouldn't be fighting? It's because they have a lot of pride. See, so they're working against God. And so considering what we just read in John 11, we, look at, we looked at verses 51 and 52 and saw Caiaphas tell them that no, one man should die for the nation. That's what he talked about, okay? And what we see here, and what's really interesting, is that the enemies of God, in this case Caiaphas, he prophesied in accordance with the word of God. Now what's weird about it is that it says in verse 52 that he didn't know what he was doing. And what you'll find is so many enemies of God, they'll quote the Bible, and they don't even recognize it. Others, they'll quote the Bible, and they know it. So let's look at that. Because whether you're dealing with those who quote the Bible and don't know it, or quote the Bible and know it, if they're in a council, they're working against God regardless. Which is my point. Okay. Go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Now we're going to look at a famous verse in its context and see what the Lord was really talking about here. Because this will help you. Because you're going to find many enemies of God quoting the word of God whether they know it or not. So how do I recognize who's actually following God and in accordance with God and assembled in one accord for God instead of being working in a council against God? Matthew 7 and verse 15, the Bible says, and this is Jesus Christ, the Bible incarnate, talking, and he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Okay, they're going to look the part. Yeah. Look at the Pope, he looks holier than me. He's got a robe and everything, white robe. I don't even have a tie on this morning. I'm in trouble, man. Okay? Verse 15. 
But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. That's what the Lord thinks when he looks at the Pope's heart. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Who? The false prophets. Now, now we preach it and we say it applies to everyone. That's not necessarily the case. Okay. But, you know, if you got to preach it, preach it, whatever, that's fine. Okay. But when it comes to the religious leaders, when it comes to those types of people, those you need to know by their fruits because they're going to cite and quote and speak Bible to deceive you. But they're not going to live it out. They never do. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus says about false prophets. You're not going to know them by what they say because they're going to be conniving and lie to you based on their words. They're going to twist and use the word of God in order to destroy you. You can only tell by the fruit of their lives where they really are. Okay? That's a great example. The Lord uses this illustration of the trees because he understands that trees have to have a good root in order to bring forth good fruit. And the root of the stem of Jesse is Jesus Christ. And if they don't have Jesus Christ in their heart, then guess what? They're a corrupt tree, no matter how much Bible they're using. And you're seeing that here with Caiaphas. He didn't know he was prophesying at the time. Okay? And you might think he would know. Because he's the high priest of the Jews. But I like how the Holy Ghost shows us in the narration. He didn't know what he was talking about. Trying to hint to you the reality. He just wanted to kill Jesus. Trying to help you out. Because you would think for somebody who's lived around the Bible all his life that he would know what he's saying. No. But there were some false prophets that did know what they were saying. Now, one example is Balaam. And we won't go to the examples in Numbers where I would show you his life. Okay, you'd find that in Numbers 24, you see him prophesying the word of God. Okay? And in Numbers 31, you see the result where he got slayed. Okay? Instead, we're going to go to 2 Peter 2 and see Peter's little summation of Balaam's life. And the reality of what, what his life shows us. Okay? Balaam. 2 Peter 2. I'll go to verse 15. The Bible says, Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Remember the Romans? They were mad at Paul and Silas and Luke because they lost their money, their money back. How dare you keep her from Susan? That's my problem with you. You see that? They love the wages of unrighteousness. These men who speak all this falsehood and gain from that financially, you shouldn't trust them. Sorry. I know pastor jokes all the time, and it's funny when he jokes about, oh, you know, I'm passing the plate, we're going to get some money here. I mean, that's obviously why I'm here. That's why he jokes about it. Because everybody knows he's worked his entire life. He's not here for the money. He's here to honor God. And that should be true for everyone. Okay? part of this congregation. Verse 16. But was rebuked for his iniquity. See, inside he was a ravening wolf. Iniquity. Inside. In your heart. The dumbass speaking with man's voice for bad, the madness of the prophet. And you see that in Numbers. Yeah. These are wells without water. See that? They profess to be a place to get the word of God from. That's why they're a well. And on the outside they look like they're a place you can get truth from. But they have no water. They have no word of God in them. Peter got it. Why is it that Peter got it, but the people who profess to follow the first Pope Peter don't get it? I'll tell you why. Spiritual darkness. It was me for 24 years. Thank God a Bible was brought to me, in this case, through a person who spoke the word, which is what a Christian is supposed to be. Verse 17. Clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. That's their end. Do you want to join them? Okay. Well, if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. That's up to you. What are you doing following a council? Okay. So Balaam, he knew what he was talking about, and yet he still wanted to gain money, and so he convinced. He took the word he got from God, and he convinced Balak, the king, hey, this is what you need to do, so that the Lord will, will judge them. Yeah, that's what Balaam did, for you to read numbers. Not only that, but say it himself. Go to Matthew 4. 
Satan knows more of the word of God verbatim than I do. Than any of us. He can quote any ver any part of scripture. All of it. He ain't saved though. Because having the Bible ain't enough. Matthew 4. Let's see him in action here. People think we're joking, but they obviously haven't read the Bible. Matthew 4 and verse 6. The Bible says, And saith unto him, This is the devil talking to God manifest in the flesh. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Yeah. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash, uh, thou dash thy foot against a stone. And here I believe he was citing Psalm 91, if I remember right. Yeah. Now if you were to check that, you found out that not only did he cite it, he purposely left words out when he cited it. That's how the devil deceives you. He gives you enough words to make you think that he's speaking religious truth, and yet he spun it. And that's all it takes to sow seeds of doubt in your mind, if thou be the Son of God. See that? And so what you'll see is the false prophets, they'll speak biblical things, but because they're following their spiritual father, okay, their fruits are going to be bad, see? and they're going to actually speak lies when they're doing so. Very interesting. Now, what did Caiaphas actually cite? Okay. Well, we won't go to these verses, but he cited verses uh, in Isaiah 53, verse 8, and also in Deuteronomy 4, verse 7, to express the idea that there should be a person who dies for the people, showing he knew at the time that Isaiah 53 was referring not to the nation of Israel, like a lot of Jews say today, see, but to the Messiah. Isn't that interesting? And then in Deuteronomy 4, it talks about Israel as the nation. Okay, that's why I wrote, put that verse. Okay. And the reality is that God had a plan for one man to die for the sake of his people that weren't just in the area of Jerusalem, but all those Jews that were scattered abroad during the diaspora. Okay. In their case, after the captivity of Babylon, not all of them came back. They were still scattered. And they're even scattered even more today. Okay. Thank God he's starting to lead his people back, but not all of them have returned to Israel. Okay, there's there's still a lot that are hanging out. Okay. Now what's interesting is that's a historical okay, interpretation that's tied to prophecy. But spiritually there's prophecy that's fulfilled through that as well in us. You see? Because it talks about gathering the children of God that were scattered abroad. Are you a child of God? So spiritually, if I were to take that out of context, it applies to us in that way. Okay. And if you go to Isaiah 49, verse 6, you'll see that Jesus Christ was sent to also be a light to the Gentiles. And so that his salvation could be sent unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It's basically what it says there. And so I like that. Without knowing it, an enemy of God gave the basis of the gospel truth. Isn't that interesting? So you wonder, it's not that people don't understand you when you give the gospel. Oftentimes they understand that perfectly. They just don't want to believe it. That's, that's the reality of it. And you, they'll be like, are you questioning my salvation? And they'll be like, oh, yes, I am. Are you saved? And they don't answer you. And then they'll come back ten minutes later. Are you still questioning me? You do the same thing. You do it like five times. And they don't even recognize that they're not answering you. Now, I say this from experience. It happened to me on Friday. No, yeah, Friday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the reality of it spiritual darkness is something else brother but thank the Lord that the Holy Ghost can work through that if we allow his spirit to fill us and use us for his glory okay. and knowing this reality that the enemies of God will cite the Bible this will help you in your evangelistic encounters okay. you'll hear people say well that's gospel truth talking about something that they believe is true and you just say, well, let me give you the gospel, and they don't believe it's true. And I'm like, well, why do, why do you say that's gospel then? What's the point of that saying? Where'd that come from? See? Or they try to say the Bible's archaic and stuff. And then you're like, oh, the word stuff, that's in the Bible. See? What about the post office? That's from the Bible. That's not from the New International Version. Are you kidding me? No, that's in the, the Word of God. It's just so archaic and out of date. All right? Okay. 
where they talk about scapegoats. Where'd that come from? So many examples. The Lord gave us so many words to use as little jump points in people's conversation to get them to the gospel. And if you have a lot of Bible in you, the Lord can get you to use those things. He'll get you to see it, hear it, process it, and put it into practice. John 11, please. John 11. I love it. Witnessing really isn't that complicated. You can make it complicated, but really it's just listening to people, being swift to hear, and slow to speak, using their words to show them that they need Jesus Christ. That's really what it boils down to. John 11, verse 54. You might wonder, how did the Lord respond to all this console stuff going on? Verse 54. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews. That's what he did. The Lord doesn't walk openly among consuls in general. Now you know. So if you're part of a consul, or if you're in accordance with a consul, the Lord ain't walking with you. You need to turn around and get on the Lord's side. But went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, very interesting, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And so we see that the Lord left them again. He had, he had done it earlier. Uh, what was it in John 8? He had left their midst. Now he did it again. Okay. And he went to take his disciples and walk with them in Ephraim. Okay. Now the word Ephraim means fruit. So when the Lord departs from a council, he goes with his congregation to bear fruit with them. See that? Okay. Now this is interesting because the Bible says for the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is. And it gives you nine characteristics. Most people think those are fruits. No, it's a, it's a fruit. Okay. I can describe an apple and say that it's red, it's crunchy, it's, you know, it's got a lot of water in it. See? All those nine things are the fruit of the Spirit. So if you fulfill all nine in your life, that's how you know you're walking with God. If you're fulfilling portions of it, then you got work to do. Okay? And the Lord knows. He's able to work through our frailty. Okay? He knows that we're but dust. But you have to have a humble heart. Okay? Meekness results from having a humble heart towards God to receive that love, to receive that joy, to receive that peace. To become gentle and good and long-suffering with others. Okay? To have temperance and peace in your life and all these things. Yeah? And to be meek towards others. Verse 55. John 11, verse 55. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And here's the third time the word Passover is referenced. In the Gospel of John, this gives you an idea of how many years the Lord's ministry was. Okay. So at the very least, three years. Okay. And notice that it was to purify themselves. Very interesting. We won't go there, but in, if you're to go to Ezra 6 and verses 20 to 22, you'll see that after the captivity, that the remnant that decided to go back, they tried to purify themselves okay, before they did the Passover to try to basically fulfill the word of God. And that involved, yes, fulfilling Levitical stuff in Leviticus, because the priests and Levites were doing that in that verse. But also, the actual children of Israel that went with Ezra, they purified themselves by separating from their outlandish women. See? And when we celebrate our spiritual Passover during the Lord's Supper, we need to deal with ourselves and get purified. We need to examine ourselves if we're in the faith. We need to repent. We need to make ourselves clean inside before we receive that bread. So we, we see that practice even today in a memorial that we do. Verse 56. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye? Will he, uh, that he will not come to the feast? So the people were wondering if the Lord's going to come. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees are given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. And there you go. That's why. Would he really come knowing that these people were asking all the Jews to tell them where Jesus was so they can take him? But guess what? The zeal of the Lord eats him up. He plans to fulfill the word of God. And he's going to go 
and fulfill the Passover regardless of what they think. See? Christian, you should be like Jesus and live for God regardless of what the world thinks, regardless of what consuls think. See? And so will you walk with Jesus would be my question. Do you want, do you have the zeal to complete the word of God like Jesus did here, which is why he decided to still go to the Passover at that point? Oh, it's up to you. And we'll continue with chapter 12 in the next class. Amen. We'll go ahead and pray and open it up for questions. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for showing us uh, your perspective on consuls. Allow us to recognize this, Lord, when we uh, look at history and when we look at current events today so we can recognize what God's people are, are actually doing in this world and what those who claim to be with God but aren't are also doing. That will help us with our perspective, especially when we're dealing with the media, Lord. And so we thank you for that. But more than that, Lord, we also thank you for the salvation that you've brought through your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Any questions or comments?